Financial management, Finn, 3701. We're looking at support material three today. Last week, we did a lot of calculations. We used those financial calculators. We worked out net present value. We worked out payback period. We worked out IRR. Now we're going to be looking at the refinements. So when, when discussing refinement, what are we trying to do? If you're refining something, what does that do to that item or that thing? What does refinement do? I don't know. Okay, Carl, what does the refinement do? Uh, it makes it better, right? It's an improvement almost. Yeah. Okay, maybe more accurate even. So it's making it better, making it more accurate, making it more relevant. Okay, so making it more relevant would be important from a decision-making point of view. Because what am I looking at here? I'm looking at financial management. Do you agree? Yes. Okay, so if I'm looking at financial management, what must I try to do to the actual decision-making? I need information, right? So to get a decision, yes. I need information that's reliable. Yes. So reliable information needs to be as accurate as, and as relevant as possible. So when we looked at study unit one, a relevant cost or a relevant expense or relevant cash flow is something that we include in the actual calculation for initial investment, operating cash flow, or terminal cash flow. Those are the three different cash flows that you had in study unit one. Do you guys remember that? Yes. Good. Okay, so when focusing on a refinement, we're trying to make the model more relevant than it actually is because we're going to be considering this risk. Can someone define risk for me? Uncertainty. Good. Okay, so if something is uncertain, there's going to be an element of risk. At the moment, we've been looking at everything when things have been certain okay so we've looking we've been looking at an environment with certainty as an assumption in reality do environments have things that are certain or do environments have things that are uncertain 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 correct okay so when looking at uncertainty we're going to be focusing on Things that we can do to the model to make the model more accurate, to make it more represent, uh, representative of things that we can't always predict or things that we can't always, um, let's say, measure reliably. Okay. All right. So in this particular module, we're looking at de dealing with risk, a concept that we need to always consider in finance. We'll look at incorporating risk. So now we're not only going to look at it, but we're going to also include it in the calculation. We'll adjust the discount rate, we'll look at certainty equivalence, and we'll look at capital rationing again. Okay, capital rationing, do companies have limited or unlimited resources? Limited. They have limited resources, exactly. So we need to allocate those resources as appropriately as possible to find the best projects to accept. And these projects always have the same time frames attached to them. No. No, they don't. Good. All right. Awesome. So to start off, let's recap and let's check if you guys are still familiar with payback period, net present value, and internal rates of return. Um, Tammy, what does payback period tell us about the... the the project well if it's gonna be worthwhile in that time am I gonna receive my money back in that time good okay so payback period is looking at receiving the initial investment back that's the focus when do you pay back the initial investment good Carl what does the NPV tell us about the project How much, how much you put in? Uh, just speak a bit louder because you're using your TV. So you're going to have to just, just, just speak a bit louder so we can hear you. Wasn't the NPV the initial investment or how much you're putting in? You just put off the... Okay, not quite. In NPV 
is the value. You're talking about the initial investment, which is what you're investing, which is the cost. Okay, so NPV is what? The value that's being created over the life of the project. Do you agree? Okay, so when do I accept? When do I accept? It's greater than one. No. Greater than one? Zero. Yes, why zero? It must be positive. Okay, I'm sorry. If NPV is positive, we're going to accept the project, right? Why do we okay. accept the project? Because it creates value. If NPV is positive, value is being created, we're going to accept the project. Make sense? Okay. Yes. Internal rate of return? What is that? What's How the internal, guys? How much you get back? How much you get back? Yeah. Okay, so with the internal rate of return, it's exactly what you get back. So if I start the project there, and I end the project there, the IRR is the actual return that I get over the life of the project. What do I compare IRR to? Cash flows. No, I don't, comp I don't compare this to cash flow. I compare it to what? This is the return, right? What do we re what do we compare oh. returns to? Profit. The cost. Okay, the cost of capital. Okay, remember the decision criteria for um, IRR was what? Internal rate of return bigger than cost of capital. Accept. Internal rate of return <coughs> less than cost of capital. Reject. Do you do you agree? Do you guys agree? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yes. Alright, so just remember which is better. Which is the best measure when looking at capital budgeting? NPV. NPV is the best. Why do we say NPV is the best? Because you get to discount all of the amounts. Even if you have further amounts that need to be reinvested. So can I can I determine NPV if I have unconventional cash flow? What is unconventional um, cash flow, guys? Do you remember? The unconventional was when a conventional when it is you have an unconventional. Okay, yeah. So um. With, with conventional, you, you're on the right track. You, you've described it in terms of cash flow. So cash flow, when it's conventional, you have outflow followed by a series of inflows. That's it. If you have unconventional cash flow, you'll have an outflow followed by a series of inflows and outflows. You'll have both, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, maybe, Carl, I know you're using the TV to, um, to, to, to attend... Um, the laptop is probably closer to the TV, I assume, than, than closer to you. Is that right? And because the microphone, if you, if, you can maybe, if you can maybe get the microphone closer to you, uh, we'll be able to hear you a bit clearer. It's, I can hear you, but it's very soft. It's not very loud. That's the only thing. Okay, so if you, if you can, I know the, the laptop probably near the TV, I guess, or the computer near, near, the, near the TV. If you can just get the microphone closer to you, we'll be able to hear you better. Okay. Alright guys, let's look at the next bit. Project. Okay, tell me what is an independent project? Describe it. 
Well, if it has nothing to do with the other project. Exactly. So can I accept more than one? Yes. Good. Okay, so with independent projects, A and B can be accepted. If I've got mutually exclusive, it's A or B. It's one or the other. So if I choose A, can I go with B? No. No. Right, B falls away. You eliminate B if they're mutually exclusive. So remember, independent projects, you can accept more than one. Mutually exclusive, you cannot. You can only accept one. Make sense? Yes. Great. So, with risk and refinements, okay, in capital budgeting, what are we going to be focusing on? Okay, is the project worthwhile? I heard that, so um, you're definitely going to consider the risk and the return, and in chapter 8 and 9, this, those are previous chapters that you've looked at before. Those chapters were focusing on this, an assumption of certainty. Okay, so everything that we have, we know it's not going to change, it's not going to fluctuate. But in reality, what can we expect? We can expect risk. So if I'm expecting risk, are things going to change? Yes. Definitely. Things will change if you do have risk. So what impact will risk have on cash flow? Okay, I didn't get all of that. Um, Carl, just say that again. You said depending on the risk. Okay, what I can gather from what you said is is the amount of risk. Okay, so the amount of risk that you have in a project will affect the cash flow. If we're looking at how it affects the cash flow, so how will risk affect, affect the cash flow? Well, let's look at a timeline. Start and end. Okay, if I look at the start and the end, which are more predictable? The start. The start. Why do you say start, Tammy? Because it's today. You know what to expect today. You don't know what's going to happen in the future. Exactly. Okay, so we can look at things today and we can then make an estimate for tomorrow or for the future. But are our estimates always mm -hmm. accurate? Well, in the beginning, maybe, but not in the end. Good. Okay, let's see. That's brilliant. Okay, so you're looking at time, right? So, so now. Okay, so Tammy, is it going to rain today? Probably. Why do you say probably? You said that last week as well. Well, yeah, well it looks like it's going to rain because of the cloud. Okay, so do you agree? If we're just forecasting for the day, it's easy to predict if it's going to rain or not because we just look at the weather. We look at the cloud cover, we look at the temperature and so on, right? But <laughs> if I asked you, is it going to rain next week? What are you going to say? Don't know. Exactly, we don't know. Okay, and the reason for that is cash flow or anything that is further in the future becomes more difficult to predict or more difficult to forecast and you can't establish an estimation. Okay, it's difficult to do so. And that's what you're looking at here with cash flow. So the point I'm trying to make here is impact on cash flow, right? The further in the future we go, the more uncertain those cash flows are going to be. Okay, so we can't estimate plus or minus in year 10 with the same amount of certainty 
for the, let's say, the initial investment. Okay, the initial investment, what's the certainty or mm -hmm. is the initial investment certain? Oh, no. The initial investment is 100% certain. Why? You know how much the project will cost you, right? So if you're buying a new project, if you're uh, or investing in a new project rather, or buying a new asset, okay, remember expansion, okay, or replace replacement or expansion. So if I'm going to be buying a new asset and replacing an old one, well, I know how much the new asset costs. Yes. I definitely will, and that's the initial investment. That's the I and V. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Great. So now we need to discuss this. The discounting. How is risk going to affect that? So obviously, cash flow. The further in the future we go, the more unpredictable the cash flow is going to be. Okay, no one knows what cash flow you're going to have in year five or in year six or seven or eight because that's going too far into the future. Let's focus on this concept now: the discounting. What variable am I using to discount the cash flows? Cost. Cost, yes, which is representative by what? Initial right. investment. Initial investment, no. No, 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 cost. You're discounting the cost back in time. So what is that? The cost of capital. The rate, the cost. So in other words, the I. Okay, the rates. That's what you're using to discount, right? Okay, because what is discounting? It's time value of money. Do you agree? Yes. Okay, so if I'm using time value of money and I'm looking at discounting, am I moving things backwards or forwards? Back. I'm moving things back. So if I'm moving things back, I'm going to need a rate. I'm going to need an I, an interest rate. So that rate is dependent on what? In Know. Think about it. What would the rate be dependent on? Interest. You say interest. How is interest going to affect the rate? <laughs> I'm just guessing. You're right. <laughs> Think about well, it. What the happens to the, the interest in rates? Does it say the same? Goes up or down. Yeah, it goes up or down. No. Right? So if the interest rate is going up or down, is there risk there? Yes. Yes, there is. Right, so you are either going to have to use a bigger or a smaller rate. Okay, you're either going to be using a larger interest rate or a smaller interest rate when discounting. Okay, the I, the rate. Okay, I will be dependent on risk. So if there's more risk, would you want the rate to be higher or lower? Lower. If it's lower, then I'm going to have a bigger value, NPV. Higher okay. or lower rate, if there's more risk? What do you guys think? Higher or lower rate? More risk means? Higher. Higher rate, yes. Higher. Okay, so a higher rate would represent higher risk. So when adjusting the discount rate, you're going to be considering that, okay, the rate that I'm going to be using. So if I'm using, let's say 10%, okay, as a rate, if I use 10%, let's assume the NPV comes out to 100. Okay, we know NPV is value. So if I discount all the cash flows with 10%, I get 100 at the end. If I increase the rate, so I'm providing for risk, let's say I want the project to now give me 12%. Is the NPV going to stay the same? No. No, the NPV is going to decrease, do you agree? Because the bigger the I, the smaller the NPV, right? Right. Do you agree? Okay, so NPV is going to be smaller. Let's say if NPV drops to 50, will you still accept the project? 
Is that a project we'll still accept? Yes. Yes, you will, because NPV is still positive. Right, so do you see how, um, how the rate affects the discounting? If I make the rate higher, I'm, I'm uh, providing for higher risk because now the NPVs are going to be smaller. So if the NPV is smaller and it's still positive, that means that project can account for the additional risk that I have in that particular scenario. That's what you're looking at. Okay, and that's what we're trying to do in terms of our expectation. So from an exam or a test point of view, you will see both of these being covered in different scenarios. Sometimes they give you the one, okay, so risk in terms of refining your refining your cash flows, or they could give you risk in relation to the actual discount rate. So providing for a change in interest rate perhaps, or a change in risk for that project when they've given you multiple rates. So we need to look at the actual net effect. Okay, what is it going to do to the decision making? Well, if I make my interest rate bigger, it's going to make the NPV smaller and that affects the decision making. If I can still get a positive NPV, even with a higher rate, that indicates a good project. Okay, a project that we would accept because the rate is a lot higher than what it is currently as the base. Okay, so it's an adjustment. It's a way to provide for certain scenarios. So the textbook takes you guys through a few approaches, different approaches when dealing with risk. Okay, so let's think about an example of risk. Um, what is a risk? Give, give me, a, uh, give me a, um, give me an example of a risk that you guys have to deal with. Something that you consider maybe day to day, or you have considered. What is a risk? Any example? Going out the door is a risk. <laughs> uh, what's a risk? Going out the door. Going out. Okay, so going out is a risk. Why? Because we live in a country where people get hijacked and shot. Okay, so maybe you could be a victim of crime, you could be hijacked. Okay, so that's definitely a risk. So. When looking at dealing with risk, there are three things that we'll consider here. So you could either look at the risk and the cash flows in terms of probabilities. Okay, so if I apply that to your example, we can say, well, okay, so if we leave the house today, what is the probability of being hijacked? Okay, the probability might be 1%. The probability might be 0,1%. Or the probability might be 10%. Or 90%. Okay, if I know what the probability is, can I then make the decision to go out or not? Yeah. Yes, you can. Okay, so if the risk is very low, are you prepared to take on that project? Yes. Yes. Okay, and there's your cap M, right? What does cap M say? Cap M says you need to get a return in line with your risk. So if I can reduce the risk as much as possible, I then can focus on maximizing the return. That's the best way to manage a business in terms of financial management. And that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the decision making. So from a decision making point of view, keep the risk as low as possible and hope for the best reward or return. Right. Can you control what's going to happen? No. No, you can't. But you can control what you're going to be doing okay, in terms of the risk. Right, so if you know um, a, a particular event is risky, you might not do that particular event. But if the risk is very low, okay, or if you're comfortable with the risk, then you'll go with it. Okay, you'll, you'll do what that event is requiring you to do. Okay, so that's one possible approach. The first approach is dealing with probability. Okay, probability, which is looking at the possibility of something arising or occurring. Okay, that's probability statistics. So we're allocating a percentage to that event occurring. Okay, so if I look at finance, okay, we can maybe look at something like recession. What's the probability of the economy going into recession? That's something we could maybe discuss or consider as part of that approach. Okay, looking at the behavior. Why do we do certain things? We base it on probability. 
Okay, so when you make a decision, have you ever thought about that? When you guys make decisions day to day, it's always based on probabilities. Do you agree? So you think, well, if I do this, what's going to happen? Or if I do that, what's going to happen? And obviously the, the action that you believe will give the best benefit is the one you're more likely going to do. Yes. Okay. All right, so number two is look at scenarios. This is another way to approach it. Okay, so scenario analysis is focusing on this. Best to worst. Okay, so you might have A, you might have B, C, D, E, and so on. And those are all the different scenarios that you've painted as a picture in terms of what will happen. So if I'm looking at financial management, we're looking at accepting projects. We're looking at investing in new projects, or we look at expanding. We look at replacing certain assets to, to make the business more productive. So with scenario analysis, you're identifying all the factors that go into that specific scenario. But you're not looking at everything, you're just looking at that one scenario. Okay, so one factor. Okay, so the factor could be, um, let's talk about tax. We've, we've got the budget speech next week. Okay, very big news announcement, the budget, the financial budget for the country. Okay, so if I'm looking at the budget, the budget is going to tell us how much tax we're going to end up paying. That's what we're looking at. So, best case scenario could be taxes stay the same or they even decrease. Worst case scenario is the tax increases by a lot. And those could be different scenarios that we could provide for. So if we've got a project that we're going to be accepting, we could say if I accept the project, what would the impact be in terms of the best and the worst case scenarios? And if you can live with the outcomes from both, best and the worst case, are we going to then go with the project? What do you guys think? So quickly repeat the question. Would you go with that particular project or um, let's say event or idea? It doesn't matter what it is. Okay, so are you going to go with the actual event if the best and worst case scenarios are best and worst case scenarios that you can live with, that you can that you're not going to mind the consequences? Yes. Yes, you will. Right, so they normally say plan for the worst and hope for the best. Okay, so that's scenario analysis. Right, you've got the best case scenario and you've got the worst case scenario. If you're comfortable with the worst case scenario and you can still live with those consequences, well, then that's a really good project to go with. Because even in a worst case scenario, it can't be worse than that. It can only be better, hopefully. That's what we'll be hoping for, I guess. Does that make sense? Yes. Great. All right, and then the last one, which you guys aren't going to look at. Okay, so in this module, they can give you scenario analysis, they can give you risk and cash flows, but they won't give you simulation because that's multi-factors. Okay, there's something that I want to share with you in terms of this. Okay, free economics is looking at statistics. Have any of you ever heard about that or read the book? There's a book and a film about it. No. Yes, no. No. Yeah. No. Okay, so just to give you some background, statistics are very, very powerful. Okay, so what they do is they look at all the different statistics across the world, okay, in terms of um, people's names, people's um, careers, their jobs, their. Um, where did they grow up? Which countries? Okay, they, they look at all of these different factors. And based on the numbers, they come up with certain conclusions. That's what they do. Okay, a conclusion. Right, and the conclusion will state what the likelihood is of a specific person maybe doing a specific thing. Okay, and that's what you're looking at, multi-factors. You're looking at lots of lots of data. Okay, lots of information. And you're trying to make a decision based on that. Okay, so quite a funny story um, looking at 
um, for economics, what they did is they were looking at names. Okay, so, so for example, your name is Carl and your name is Tammy. Okay, so if we're looking at Carl and Tammy, what what name could you have had that would have changed, let's say, who you were? So if you if you had a different name, would that have changed your personality? Would that have changed your job? Would that have changed your um your your future in Vertical? Okay, that's what they're focusing on. So that was just one thing that they did as part of the study. Okay, so what they did is they studied all the different names. They looked at all the popular names in the world. And they then made um, they made a chart in terms of which names are more likely to be, let's say, doctors, or which names are more likely to be surgeons, okay, or lawyers, or scientists, or whatever. Okay, but that's what they were focusing on. And what they do there is they look at multiple factors. So they're looking at the name, they're looking at where they grew up, they're looking at the country, they're looking at the age, they're looking at all sorts of different factors to come up with a recommendation. But to come up with information that can be used to make a decision. Right, and that's what they did. So, you, you obviously don't want to give your child a name that might, um, that might not be in their best interest. Okay, in terms of, I mean, today you get very, very strange names, okay, and those names might actually put that child at a disadvantage rather than an advantage, okay, going um, through life uh, as, as an individual. Right, that was just something interesting that they did in the study. They also did other things as well, looking at data. Okay, that's all they did, is they looked at data. They didn't interview someone, they just looked at the numbers. They looked at the data and they looked at what the data was using. Okay, so if we're focusing on these two, that's what we're going to be looking at a lot in financial management. What risk, from a capital budgeting point of view, is there? What is risk, from a capital budgeting point of view? What's the risk, guys? What's the risk, guys? Think about it. Capital budgeting refers to what? But first, define that for me. What does that mean? The capital you're going to be putting into a project. Correct. Okay, so budgeting is where you're allocating those funds. So if I'm allocating those funds to different projects, A, B, C, D, depending on what, how many projects you've got. Okay, what is the risk then from a capital budgeting point of view? What's the uncertainty? Are you going to... Are you going to al be allocating it to the right project? Possibly. Okay, that could be a risk. So, how are we going to allocate that to the different projects? That, that could be a consideration. But think about what is risk from the actual budget point of view. If you do allocate funds to A, but A doesn't provide you with the return that you had expected, is that a risk? Yes, it is. It is. Will your company into a deficit? It will, yeah, put your company um, in a deficit. Okay, so if we're focusing on internal and external factors, okay, risk from a capital budget point of view could be internal or external. So internal could be maybe you didn't allocate enough capital to that project. Okay, or maybe you you um. You've underestimated, okay, the the cost. Right, so you haven't provided for the enough. Uh, you haven't provided enough for the cost that will arise for that particular project. Okay, sometimes we overlook it. Okay, so maybe you thought the project was good, but now certain costs arise that you didn't foresee. So the budget is, remember, an estimate. It's just a guess. It's a it's an educated guess. A budget is your estimate of what you think is going to happen. And if you don't look at all the variables, you can overlook something which is a risk. 
external could be things like inflation things that we don't really see uh, or maybe it changes in interest rates okay or um, exchange rates okay so that could be an external factor or maybe politics all right so what happens in government can affect the project that we invest in okay does that make sense guys yeah all right so internal and external factors both can contribute to risk from a capital budgeting point of view it depends on what the focus is is the focus on internal things that we do that can affect the budgeting process or is it something external things that we don't know what will happen but that can affect the budgeting okay from an external point of view right the key word i put here is this variability okay you'll always have an expectation right and our expectations aren't always right so we need to look at the changes that can arise okay the risks that can arise internal and external okay because if um, let's say if something external happens if the taxes do go up will the cash flows vary Will the cash flow vary if the taxes change? What do you guys think? Yes. Definitely, yes. Okay, taxes, okay, or well, changing tax rates, or uh, maybe more deductions or less deductions, will definitely have a consequence on the variability of the cash flows. Okay, the um, how constant they're going to remain okay or if they're going to fluctuate and change right so that's looking at cash flow as a focus and we're obviously going to be looking at cash flow a lot because that's the only way they can really test the actual decision making is by asking you to work out the cash flows first which is your initial investment your ocf and your tcf and after having calculated those three i then do a analysis okay in the form of npv payback period and irr okay those are the ones that you've seen so far and profitability index okay, you did see that formula last week as well all right so let's discuss risk and cash flows in more detail we've got a timeline let's put the cash flows on the timeline so give me the cash flows that you would put here which cash flows go where guys what do I have in range? What do I have at the beginning? The initial investment. Correct. Is that positive or negative? Positive. A negative. Which one? Negative. Why? Because that's money. It's an uh -huh. outflow, correct. Okay, so initial investment will be a negative. Give me another cash flow. Operating cash flow. Correct, and that goes over the life of the project or investment. Okay, we hope that those are positive, but they can also be negative. If they're negative, then you'll have non-conventional cash flow. And there's one more. Where do we put the last one? Terminal. Correct, right at the end. Positive or negative? Positive. Positive, yeah. Okay, so remember terminal cash flow is what we get at the end of the project. Okay, we normally dispose of the assets. So you buy something today, you use it, and then toward the end, you get rid of it. Is it always positive? Most of the time, yes. If it was negative, then that means you're investing something at the end, or you're paying something at the end. Right, so it, it could be negative perhaps if you have to maybe, um, let's say, um, let's say uh, like cleaning up, for example. So if I'm going to be looking at mining, okay, if I'm, if I'm, a, mine, if I'm a mining company, right, mining companies obviously go in certain areas, okay, and they look for precious metals and so on. So a mining company might have to put the land back in the condition that it can be used for other things. Not just go uh, mine in certain areas without, let's say, 
um, I forget the right word to describe that, um, but you're, you're like fixing. You're fixing what had gone wrong, okay, or what had created. It's, it's like putting it back into its normal state. Okay, so you've used something, um, you've derived benefit from it, and then right at the end, you have to, um, you have to, uh, I want to use the word clean up, inverted commas, okay, because you're cleaning up um, the operations that you've done in that area, if that makes sense. Okay, so TCF can be negative if there's an outflow at the end of the project. And there might be. Okay, that outflow could be because you need to um, clean up the environment. Okay, it's normally positive because generally at the end of the project, you'll be disposing of all the assets. Okay, so if I buy something today, that's the initial investment. Okay, then I'm using the asset. After I've used the asset, at the end of the life of the asset, I'm then going to get rid of it. And by getting rid of it, there's going to be an inflow. Okay, because remember TCF, uh, we looked at new and old, replacement versus expansion. And we said replacement is what they like to give you in the exam because that requires you to look at the old assets. And obviously, if I'm looking at the old asset, there's going to be some sort of proceed that I can get from having scrapped the asset at the end of the life. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right. So, which cash flows will be most impacted by risk? The TCF. The TCF definitely because it's at the end. Okay. So the answer for that question would be just future cash flows. Future cash flows are most impacted by risk, and the more I go forward in terms of. Um, predicting what's going to happen in the future, the more risk is going to be as part of the actual working, okay, as, as the calculation, the model. Is that alright? Yeah. yeah. So what considerations are we going to have to look at that's going to affect future cash flows? This is a lot here. You guys can probably think of many. You can think of maybe internal if you want. You can think about external if you want. It doesn't matter. But there will be considerations that will affect the future cash flows. So can you give me some examples? What could affect those cash flows? Anything, guys? What examples can you think of? economic conditions okay so describe the example then that's something to consider so how would economic conditions impact future cash flows well like interest rates okay there's one example so now you've given an example of your example so interest rates would be part of the economics okay so how would the interest rates affect the future cash flows Well, the higher the interest rates, the lower the future inflows of cash. Okay, possibly. That, that, that's something you could consider. So you could say, well, if there are higher interest rates in the future than there are now, okay, higher rates in the future will give rise to an increase in expenses that I need to pay. So if that's an outflow, Okay, you could assume that higher interest rates in the future would give rise to mo more outflows than inflows compared to today. Okay, so that's a good example. That's something that we could consider in terms of economics. Right, economics obviously covers a lot of different topics. You focused on the interest rate as being one of those topics. You could definitely motivate that as being a consideration for predicting future cash flows. Right, so our future cash flows could be either higher or lower depending on what the inflation rate or what the interest rate is currently at the moment. Okay, good. Alright, so here's your first calculation. Okay, we've got break-even cash flow. Right, so what is what does break-even mean? When you break even. Yeah, when you break even means what? How how do you know you've broken even? What equals what? Expense equals income. Correct. 
Income equals expenses. Okay, so you haven't made a profit. You haven't made more. You haven't created more value. All right, so if I look at company A, company A has a cost of capital of 10% and they're evaluating two mutually exclusive projects, X and Y. So if they're mutually exclusive, what does that mean? One or the other. Good. Can I choose X and Y? No. No. It's either X or Y. It's one or the other. So each requires 500000 as an initial investment over a period of 15 years. What would the break-even cash flow be? What am I calculating, guys? Come think time value of money. We're applying that here. Good. See, work out the payment. Okay, so guys, grab the calculator, okay, and work out the payment for this particular example, having been given the rate, the time, and the 500,000 initial investment. Quickly do that in your calculator. What do you guys get? No, man, I can't get it. Why not? I don't know. What are you putting in there? The negative 500 PV yeah. in okay, I'm happy 15 with that. Okay, so negative 500 is your PV, good. Okay, then I said... Oh, I think I pressed future value. Okay, 15 N, 10 I, and then PMT. Yes. I get zero. No. Okay, Carl, what did you get? Yeah. Um, okay, 6, 5, 7, yeah. 3, 6. Yes, 6, 5, 7, 3, 6. With some sense. Yeah. Okay, tell me what yeah. went wrong. Try again. You might be, did you did you clear the calculator first? Yes, and it's one py. Okay, perfect. So if it's one py, good. The calculator in the right mode. Type all of that in. Okay. Remember to use the plus negative. minus button, not the negative as in minus, as in operation minus. Subtract. Okay, it's the plus minus button. That changes okay, the sign. Maybe. Maybe you're pressing okay. the wrong minus button. Yes. Okay. okay, now I get it. Okay, good. Okay, so what was the problem? That's plus minus button. Okay, there we go. So just remember to use that button. Don't use the actual minus button because that means subtract. Okay. Okay. All right, so when solving for the payment, you've identified what the payment is, which is what? The yearly amount that you're going to have to provide for to do what? Break even. Okay, break even means do I get more than 10%? Uh, okay. Do I get more than 10%, guys? Who says yes? Yeah. <coughs> Who says no? Yeah, you're getting like... Yeah, you're breaking even and making more profit. Or making a bit more. Okay, what does break even mean? Break even means your costs are equal to your returns. Yeah, it means you're covering all your costs. You're covering the costs only. Are you making, are you creating value? Yes. No. Okay, because the payments are 65736. Okay, so do you agree the cost of capital for this company is 10%. If the company is going mm. to raise 10% in the market, okay, to get half a million, okay, and then they're going to be investing it in a project that's going to last 15 years, okay, they want to know how much must the project yield as a yearly amount that will allow us to break even, i.e. to pay for the expenses of running the project. That's what we're, that's what we're asking. Okay, 
the answer is 65,736. So this is the yearly amount that the project is going to have to provide us with to just break even. Okay, so if I wanted to make a profit, then your cash flow should be greater than 65,736. If it's bigger, then you're generating a profit. You're <coughs> creating value. If it's less than, is the company breaking even? So that no, so the PE should be greater than that. Sorry, just say that again. I didn't hear that, Carl. I'm confused. So you're saying the PV must be greater than that 6573. Not the PV, the PMT, the payment. Um, okay, so let's, let's recap this. Let's draw a picture. Initial investment, 500, right? Yeah. This 500,000 is an initial investment that we've had to invest, which is a negative. Where does that investment yes, come yes. from? It comes from your financing. So you will either yeah. use debt or equity, but how much does it cost you? Uh, okay. So it costs you 10%. Uh, Do you agree? Yeah. Okay. How long is this project going to last for? 15 years. <laughs> yes, 15 years. Okay, so what you're saying here is the break-even cash flow is 6 uh, what is it? 65736. Six. Yeah. That's what we're saying. Right, so we're saying just to break even, i.e. to cover the cost of capital for this 500000 that we would have taken out at the beginning to accept the project requires 65736 six every year for the next 15 years to cover the cost of investing in the project. Okay. Do you get it? Yeah. Okay. So now I'm considering something extra. The extra bit that I'm considering here, I'll change the color so we can write it down. The additional consideration that I said was, if the cash flow, if the payments are greater then 65736. Is that project making a profit? Is that project creating value? Yes. Yes, because it breaks even if the project only yields 65736. Okay. You got it? Yeah. Okay, and then just the opposite if it's less than. So if the project only creates 50 every month, this project is actually losing value not gaining value because it's less than what the break even is makes sense yeah okay great okay carl you're happy tammy are you happy i think so okay all right so let's take that example one step further because remember we're looking at this a refinement so what is a refinement? It's how do we make it better? Okay, so now do you agree X and Y are offering the same amount in terms of break even? But which project am I going to accept? Well, I need to consider are they mutually exclusive or are they independent? Which are they? Independent. Mutually exclusive. Okay, so they're mutually exclusive. So if it's mutually exclusive, is x different from y no because they had the same break-even point so it's difficult to consider which project is better but this is risk okay here is a consideration in terms of risk so now i've given you some additional information the company expects a hundred percent probability of receiving the cash flows from x but only a 65% probability of receiving the cash flow from Y. So now, are these projects both equal from a capital budgeting perspective? No. Why not? Because the probability of receiving cash is not the same. Correct. So which project is more risky? The 
65% one, X. No, not X. Y is riskier. Yeah, Y has the 65% probability. Yeah. Okay, the 100% probability is X. So remember, we're looking at certainty. Okay, so now can we make a decision? Can we choose X over Y? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes. Because we know X has more certainty, i.e. it has lower risk. Y has higher risk. X, lower risk. Y, higher risk. And it's only because of this, the probability of receiving the cash flows. Okay, so we're not going to consider Y if we can consider X, which has more certainty. Okay, remember it's about reducing your risk and maximizing your return as much as you can. Make sense? Yeah. Great. Right, so how would I approach this if I had scenario analysis? Well, this is what you would do. I've given you guys two projects here. Now we're looking at project A and we're looking at project B. We're analyzing the cash flow for the different scenarios. Right, so how much do each, each of the projects require as initial investment? 500. Correct. Are they both the same in terms of initial investment? Yes. Okay, yeah. but A and B have different scenarios. Okay, so those are the three scenarios. Scenario 1, Scenario 2, and Scenario 3. Okay, so in a pessimistic type of scenario, A will still give us 75,000 as a cash flow. Scenario 2 is the most likely scenario, which means normal situation. Okay, so in a normal situation, A will give 100. And in an optimistic situation, they'll give 125. But if I look at B, B, most likely 100, pessimistic, nothing, and optimistic, 200. Okay, obviously we've spoken about range before. When we looked at... Um, FIN 2601, we looked at risk there in relation to cap M, and we spoke about range as being one measure of risk. So if I just look at range, which project would you consider to be more risky? B. Correct. B would no. be considered to be more risky because the range of values that you could possibly get are more spread apart. Happy with that? Make sense? Yeah. Okay, so if I'm yeah. assuming 10% yes. as the cost of capital, what is that representing, 10%? It's the financing. Do you agree? Uh. Sorry, please repeat the question. The 10%. Do you agree the 10% represents cost of capital, which is the financing? Yeah. Okay. We've got a 15-year time horizon. We need to calculate the NPV according to the different outcomes. Okay. So when I substitute all of this into my calculator, what am I solving for? The NPV. Yes. And are the cash flows different or are they the same? Different. They're the same for the different scenarios. So if the scenario is, if I'm looking at 75,000, that's my payment. That's my initial investment, right? What's my N? What's my N? 15. What's my I? 10. 10. Good. What are you solving for? Uh, NPV. Okay, we don't need NPV, we just need PV because NPV and PV are the same here because the cash flows are consistent. See? 75,000 is the payment. It's an annuity. If you had different cash flows, then you would have to use the NPV. Do you agree? Yes. Okay, so on your calculations, work that out. What's the PV, guys? 
I use 10, N is 15, initial investment 500, pessimistic 75. What's the PD? So the INV is the PV. The INV is the initial investment. But which button is that? Okay, you're including the initial investment. So if you're including the initial investment, remember we're comparing it to the initial investment. So I just want the PV. Don't worry about the initial investment. The initial investment is what we're comparing it to. Okay, okay remember that's NP. Okay. That's a separate calculation. I just want the PV. The N is 15, the I is 10, the payment is 75. What do you get? PV is? Uh, 570. 570. Okay, let's check. Alright, so do you agree NPV equals present mm -hmm. value of the future cash flows minus the initial investment? Do you agree? That's the formula you saw last week. Yes. Okay, what am I working out first? I'm working out this, the present value of the future cash flow. And what am I using? I'm using 10, 15, and 75. Alright, so if you type that into your calculator, N is 15, I is 10, payment minus 75 so I can get a, pu a plus and you get 570 good so that is correct okay 574.55 did you get did you guys get that yeah good okay so 574.55 is the present value of the cash flow then I minus the 500 which is the initial investment so if you take a 500 what are you left what are you left with 70 Seven, Correct. Seventeen four five five or four five six. There's it. Okay, so now you've worked out the the NPV according to the pessimistic view. All right, and I've done a few others as well. I've done this one for you. I've done that one for you. I've done that one for you. This is scenario analysis. I want you guys to do this one. Optimistic. Can you find NPV for those two? Okay, we just did one together. I showed you how to get the pessimistic 70456. Do you agree? Yeah. Okay, so I want you to find the NPV for optimistic. What are those two lines? Using the information you had here. Hey, try that guys, I'll give you some time. Just quickly go. Okay, you've got two to do, hey? You guys had to do the optimistic NPV for A and the optimistic NPV for B. Okay, so we've got one answer so far. Quickly do the next one as well. See if you guys can get B and then we'll check both. Yeah. Okay, so let's have a look at your answers. I'll put up the answers here. Okay, so at the bottom here on your screen, um, for the first one, you're going to be getting 70456, which we had. We got that one. Okay, this one, NTV for, for A, is 45. 450760 and for B 1021216 those are the marks you should be getting I don't get that you're not getting it which one aren't you getting both both 
Okay, let's start with optimistic for A. Okay, so optimistic for A, what's the monthly cash flow? What, what's the yearly cash flow? The 125,000. 125,000, correct. Okay, so on your calculator, you're putting in 125 as the payment, your N is 15, your Next. I is 10. Solve for the PV. Because what do you get? Must I put the payment in as negative? The payment, if, it, if the payment's in as negative, then your answer will come out as positive. It doesn't matter. It's just the number that you want. The amount that I want is this one. 950760. I get to 950. Yeah, 950760. Yes. Okay, there you go. That's the first step. Then what do you do? You need to take off the initial investment. So if you minus 500,000 yes. from that, do you get 450760? Do you guys get that? Yeah. Yeah. I just got one or two numbers off because I didn't, I didn't um, what you call it, round off and everything. But yeah, I've just rounded it off just to just so we can fit it in because the table's quite small. So I've just kept it rounded off, yeah. Because uh, I got four, five, zero, seven, nine, five, or five, nine instead of six, seven, nine. Yeah, the, the marks might be a bit off because of the rounding. Yeah, I've just tried to keep it simple, just, just use the whole numbers. Okay. Tell me, did you get it? <laughs> Yeah, okay, I good. don't know where I went wrong. Pardon? I just don't know where I went wrong because that's exactly what I did. So it must be a finger error. Possibly, yeah. You probably typed something in incorrectly. Okay, so just be careful when you type in the advance. Okay, did you both get this one now? Or can you both get this one now after having done the one together? Let me just have a look here. One, five, one. Yeah, I got that as well. Okay, you got it. Okay, good. Just check yours, Tammy. Yes. Are you there? Yes. Good. Okay, so that's looking at what? Scenario analysis. Huh. All right, simul uh, sim simulation isn't something that you guys are going to have to worry about. So don't stress about this. Um, if you guys have done some of the staff modules um, from UNISA, um, ST1501, 1502, they cover things like this. Okay, do you see you can from 15, uh, not 15, 16, not 16, 2. Six oh one. Sorry, the numbers aren't right. Okay, two six oh one. We're gonna look at two six oh one. Do you remember the table here? Alright. Uh okay, that was a whole massive table, but I do remember it. Okay, right, that is the table. Well done, yeah. So genetic deviation is a measure of this. Variance was a measure of this. Okay, so let's look at simulation. We're looking at building a bigger model that covers more of these different topics. Okay, and all of these topics are going to be focused on trying to get a model that best represents reality. Okay, so obviously remember, with mathematics you can model different things, and you can try to build more complicated models that try to predict what is going to happen. Okay, where you're building lots of different variables. But they normally do this on Excel, and they build models where you change certain things and other things change updates, which create something that you need to Are we going to be touching up this in this module? No. Okay, so the way we want to make something that we're here is, we want to be switching on it. We'll be looking at the first two examples. Evaluating cash flow, evaluating all the different but don't worry about international situation, this is just an additional note that I've been putting on the slide for discussion. Do exchange rates stay the same? 
No. They can change. So when exchange rates change, so can the cash flow. Okay, because think about it. Which companies are going to have to consider their changes in cash flow if they're looking at exchange rates? Local international. International. Correct. Okay, so if we look at imports and exports or inputs and outputs, there could be certain risks that we need to consider here. And hedging is a way to help manage or reduce the exchange rate risk. Hedging is a way to try to fix or to keep the rate the same to avoid this becoming a risk as part of our calculation. Something else? Political risk. Politics can affect business and that will affect the consideration in terms of doing business in a global country. Okay, so think about, I mean, think about the US at the moment, okay? Obviously, we've got a new president in the US, right? And do you think the US's policies in terms of the, pol the political situation, would US polit policies affect other countries? Yes. It can. Right, and that's something. Right, so how do we factor these into capital budget? Can I measure exchange rate risk? No. Can I measure political risk? No. So how do I measure exchange rate capital budget? If I can buy it. Yes. Yes. Well, what, what, what do I do? How will I consider? Well, I must consider the effect that the economy is going to take because, I mean, like with the Trump thing, the dollar has been very uncertain. So, I don't know if it's going to go up or go down. Or so, if you invest and then it goes down, you start losing money and all that. Okay, that's, that's good. You guys are taking it very far in terms of what you could possibly do. Let's keep it simple. If I'm looking at refining the model, what can I change? I can either change the cash flow or I can change the rate. So what do you think I'm going to use here? Can I change the rate or can I change the cash flow? No. Which one? Yes. Which one, guys? Cash flow. I can't change the cash flow. How will I know how political risk is going to change the cash flow? It's going to be difficult to do that. Do you agree? Do you agree? But you can't change the rate. I can change the rate. I can provide for more risk as part of the rates. Okay. And that's why we can build certain things that aren't measurable. Okay, explicitly measurable. Like political risk. Like exchange rate risk. And you could look at this. A risk adjusted discount rate. Okay, so when adjusting the discount rate, what am I doing? I'm looking at our expectation. Okay, so let's look at a scenario. If we are going to be operating in another country, okay, let's take two examples. Let's talk about um, a country that's more developed versus a country that's more developing. Okay, so the, the example that I'd like to use here is if we had to, if we had to operate in Zimbabwe, are we going to adjust the rate? Yes. Is it more risky or less risky to operate in Zimbabwe? More risky. It's more risky. So will you increase or decrease the rate? Increase. You'll increase the rate, exactly. Okay, we spoke about this a bit earlier. When we, we talked about a higher rate represents higher risk. Right, so countries or even politics, okay, any risk, it doesn't matter what, you can provide for more risk in your risk adjusted discount rate. And what is that going to affect? Higher risk, higher RADR. So if I have a higher I, what is that going to do to my NPV? Make it lower. Yes, good. Okay, so if the interest rate is higher, the NPV will be 
lower. Lower. Okay, the RADR. We're looking at a risk adjusted discount rate. The RADR. Okay, so if I make the risk adjusted discount rate bigger, am I providing for more risk? Yes. Yes, I am. So if I'm providing for more risk, I'll have a smaller NPV. If we know NPV is smaller and it's still positive, is that a good product to accept? Yes. Yes, it would be. Okay, so do you see how we're building in more risk by adjusting the discount rates? Yeah. Nice. Okay. Right, just some revision here um, in terms of some notes, in terms of theory. You guys should remember CAPM, right? Yeah. Give me the relationship. What is the relationship? Describe it to me. Increase in risk increases your return. Good. So, should companies operate at the top or the bottom of that line? Top. Correct. Companies would look to accept, okay, when the risk is a specific amount but the return is higher that's the best project that you can accept projects that offer the most return for that level of risk make sense yeah yeah good okay so here's the graph for cap m you've seen this before it's a bit of revision okay remember you've got a premium so when looking at that this is the premium Okay, so what I expect compared to the risk-free, what is the risk-free rate going to be? Where do I get that? What is the risk-free rate? Well, where you're guaranteed not to make a loss. Okay, where you're guaranteed to get a return without risk. So what assets do we consider risk-free? Cash. Okay, so treasury bills, T bills, bonds, short term bonds, okay, NCDs. Okay, when we looked at bonds, okay, we spoke about bonds that are risky and bonds that aren't. So when looking at risk free, we're looking at the rate that's attributable to assets that don't lose value, okay and it will always gain value. Okay, so think about savings. If you put money in the bank as a saving, um, or as savings in terms of a savings account, is there any risk of you losing that money? No. No, unless the entire bank goes bankrupt, then you'll lose everything. But the cash that you put in the savings account would be considered risk-free. Okay, risk-free is just a term that the financial managers refer to as the amount that will receive that doesn't require any risk. Okay, so if I am taking on more risk, what's going to happen to the return? Increase. It's going to increase, exactly. Right, so there's your CAPM equation. You've seen this before. Okay, when looking at non-diversifiable, systematic, or beta risk, this is looking at the market risk. And that's why we've got that there. KM is the market. Okay, what does RF stand for? Risk free. Correct. Okay, so how do we apply the decision criteria? What do we do? What are we comparing against required rates of return? I don't know. Think about it. Required return must be compared to what? To the rate of return. To the expected return or to the internal rate of return. Okay, so you're comparing the required return to your IRR or to your expected return. Okay, so what you're requiring 
versus what you're getting. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So there's the diagram. There's capital, the capital asset pricing model. How does this affect budgeting? Well, with budgeting, I accept when I'm above and I reject when I'm below because we're looking at risk to reward. Okay, so you want your risk and reward to be as big as possible. Right, so at any level of risk, it doesn't matter where I am, okay? I can have high risk or I can have low risk. But I need to be finding projects that offer more reward to risk. Projects that offer a return that's greater than what I should just be getting in terms of required. Okay, so this line over here refers to the required return. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Right, so let's have a look at these different scenarios. Let's incorporate scenario analysis with the risk adjusted discount rates. Okay, remember RADR is looking at adjusting a rate for different levels of risk. Okay, so we've got a project. The project has three different considerations. Well, actually four, okay? We've got low, average, above average, and high. Okay? If we're looking at the project and we're focusing on the RADR, you've got four different rates. So if I have four different rates, how many NPVs could I have? Yeah, you'll have four NPVs. Do you agree? You'll have one NPV at 8%. You'll have one NPV at 11%, you'll have one NPV at 17 and you'll have another NPV at 25 Do you agree? Okay, which NPV is going to be the smallest? Low. Low. Low or high? Low. No. If you use a small rate, the NPV is going to be very... Big or small? Uh, very big. big. And if you use a very big interest rate, your NPV is going to be? Small. Correct. Okay, smaller. All right, so looking at that, when are we going to accept or reject? When the NPV is below zero. No, below. Below zero or above zero? That's what I said. Below. Below or above? Well, it has to be positive, so it yes. must be... Sorry, I'm getting confused. Okay. NPV must be greater than zero to accept the project. So it doesn't matter what rate I use. I can use 8%, 11%, 17%, 25%, it makes no difference. As long as the NPV is positive, I'll accept the project. So if I look at this, if the project is considered to be high risk, okay, and I calculate an NPV and the NPV is still positive, will I accept this project? Yes. Yes, you will. Okay, because now, even with a higher risk, you're still getting value from the project. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So how do we apply the above to a capital budgeting decision? We're calculating multiple NPVs to make a decision. Okay. All right. Then a note over here about refinements. Is it fair to compare projects with unequal lives? Yes. Really? Is it fair? To compare unequal lives? No, not really, because one always might be a lot different than the other. Yes, okay, the answer is no. It's not fair to compare these two projects. So, have a look at these two. I've got X and Y. Which project is better? We don't know. We need to calculate, right? Yes. Okay, so do the periods have to be the same? They should be. Can we refine the calculations? Yes, we can. 
Right, so step number one, guys. Use the calculator's cache function. Okay, so either the CF or the HP or the cache mode on the on the Casio. I want you guys to give me an NPV for X and an NPV for Y. What are the answers for those two? You guys have them? Almost. Almost, okay. Answers, guys. Let me just quickly. Okay, you're still busy with why? I just, I just want to redo um, X quickly. Alright, so what did you get for X, Tammy? 1512772.35 Okay, and what did you get for Y, Carl? Um, 190132 Okay, yes, well done guys. So 112772 and 190133 those are the two answers. Okay, there, there, there. X and Y. Guys happy? Yeah. No, wait. Where? 112772. 190133. No, I didn't get that. Which one didn't you get? I think you did get X. You said 112. No, I said one five one two. One five one two. All right. So you're not getting it. So what are you doing incorrectly? I don't know. Okay. So clear the calculator. So. Uh, yes. Seven hundred thousand plus minus button. Press CF. Oh, that's where I'm going wrong. I keep on forgetting that plus minus. Ooh, there's the mistake. Be careful. Okay, so just do X quickly, okay. it's, it's shorter, so let's just do X just to check. Okay, you can check Y later, but write okay. the answer down. Okay, the answer's up here, right? Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, so let's just do, y, do X so, quickly. One one two seven seven two. Okay. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. So both of you are comfortable getting the NPV. That's great. Right. The next bit we need to discuss is this. Can we now look at an annual cash flow? 
because remember those projects had different lives right so X had how many years three and Y six mm -hmm. Yes, are you guys still there? Yeah. Okay. Launch G. Okay, X. X had three, Y had six years, right? Mm -hmm. Three years for X, six years for Y. Is it fair to compare the two projects? No. Okay, so what must I do? I need to annualize the amounts. Right, and this is what we do. So this is new. Okay. What am I going to do for X? Well, what was the NPV? There's it. So for project X, what am I going to do? I'm going to take the net present value and I'm going to apportion it for how many years? Three years. And I'm solving for the payment. Because what does the payment do? The payment takes the amount and it splits it over a period of time. Is that alright? Mm -hmm. That's how you work out your annualized NPV. So this amount is the annualized NPV. Is that alright? Yeah. Okay. Right, so you guys do Y. What is the annualized NPV for Y? 3656. Six. Did you get that as well, Carl? Yeah. Okay, let's check if you guys are right. No. Okay. This is the NPV, annualized NPV. How many years uh -huh. did Y have? Six. Six years. What was the PV for NPV for Y? 190133, right? Yeah. And if you solve for payment, you get that. Do you agree? Guys, do you agree? Alright, okay, so Carl, so um, what answers did you get um, from the actual uh, working? You should have gotten Project X. X was 45, 3, 4, 7, right? And Y was 4, 3, 6, 5, 6. Okay, so that was X and Y um, in terms of the annualized NPV. Do you agree? Okay, so which project is better here, X or Y? X. X is better than Y based on the annual amount because it generates more each year. So X is a, X is a shorter project. It was only three years long. Y was a six-year project. Okay? You can see X is a lot better than Y. Yeah. All right, but when we looked at NPV, so if you go back, our NPV for X and Y, it was slightly different. Okay, here we had Y with a bigger NPV and X with a smaller NPV, but that was for the total duration of the project. Okay, so in, in terms of total, okay, so the absolute amount that the project yields, Y is better over the full duration of the project, X is better on a year-by-year -year basis. Is that right? Okay, 
Right, so when looking at the last bit on slide 22, there's a note here about strategic factors. Okay, they don't ask about strategic factors in the exam, but they do test the capital rationing. So do you remember what capital rationing is? Correct, you're right. Okay, so capital rationing is assigning a certain amount of resources to certain projects because resources are limited, right? Yeah. And that's something we need to consider. So when applying the selection approach, you need to look at IR and you need to look at NPV. That's always what we do as a calculation. And which do we use as the better measure? Yeah. Which is the better measure, IR or NPV? NPV is better, correct. So always focus on maximizing value rather than profit. It's always the key. And value is best represented by NPV. NPV is the best measure of value. Got it? Is that right? Okay, perfect. All right, then on the last slide, it's just a summary of what we looked at this week, which was looking at the risk the behavioral approaches, the cap M again, which you've which is very popular. Cap M always comes up, and then some budgeting refinements. Right, if you can try do some of the extra activities in the study guide, um, and there are some additional ones in the textbook as well. Uh, we will be doing more examples when we look at the assignment, and we'll do lots and lots of past papers when we get there.